In the pleasant summer of 1914, the American community was in July, was finding it easier and happier than ever before in its history. Washington cream pie. You like a cookie? In America's brave little world of 1914, a self-contained and contented people could look back with satisfaction on nearly a century and a half of unparalleled progress and prosperity. American industry led the world and was rapidly increasing its lead. To contribute to and share in the wealth of a growing nation, emigrants from every part of the world were still flocking to U.S. shores, bringing up their children in the American community as new first-generation Americans. Most communities of any size in 1914 could boast of their own daily newspaper, whose editor championed their causes, helped fight their battles. And Americans of 1914 were little interested in news outside their own community and their own nation. The country was still debating after two years the merits of the new freedom Logan of Woodrow Wilson, the first Democrat to occupy the White House since Grover Cleveland. The Panama Canal, in which the whole nation took pride, was scheduled finally to be opened in mid-August. And the man most responsible for the canal, ex-President Theodore Roosevelt, was still a powerful figure on the U.S. political scene. The regular army of the United States totaled just under 100,000 men in the summer of 1914, and many a U.S. citizen felt that even this number was excessive for a force that had little to do but chase Mexican bandits. Heavier than aircraft were undergoing tests by a few young and far-sighted army officers who hoped eventually to put the new invention to some useful military purpose. Fast achieving popularity was the hesitation canter, a startling new outgrowth of the turkey trot. In 1914, young citizens of America were looking forward with high hope to the future of a land which was still the new world. It was a settled and ordered world in which youth, keen and confident, saw limitless opportunities. There were new standards and new ideals, new entertainment and new pleasures. Well, just as the train came to a trestle, she got to the window and jumped out. Well? Well, that's the way it ended until next week. Isn't that just like them? An earnest people, living in a land grown powerful and great, were only beginning to realize how truly great their nation was. Until the arrival of the paper train on a morning of June 1914, Europe and Europe's troubles seemed very far away. Say, Harry, is an archduke like a prince? 
Or was he like a king? Search me. In the days that quickly followed the first declaration of war, as country after country mobilized and marched, the news that mattered most was the news of Europe and its spreading battlefronts. It was America's foreign-born who first felt the impact of the war in Europe, and they tried as best they could to explain it to their American friends. To them, war was a sad, familiar old-world story the age-old blight upon the lands from which they came. Anna, Weisskirchen, look, right here in the paper. <sighs> Registered letter for Joe, Mrs. Kovac. Looks like something from the old country. You can sign for it. Can you two have to sign for this? You don't want me to bring it back again, do you? Sign right here. Thank you. Goodbye. Joe, the postman brought it this morning. What does it say, Joe? It's for the army. We talk it over when we get home, Mama. Austria? I don't know where they're from, but the Path A Weekly is on now.
You got army papers too, huh, John? Yeah, come today. What do you think? Ah, uh, not for me. That's all country business. I'm staying in America with the wife and kids. What you going to do? If you don't go now, you never get back to all country. I go Monday, maybe. Sure. Now, Mama, in times like these, a man's got to do what he thinks is right. Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen. When do you go, Joe? I take the train for New York this afternoon. Did you ask them about the money? Well, Anna, they said it's, it's hard to get money through from the old country now. What are we going to live on? Oh, Papa, I'm sorry. Come, we go. With the invasion of neutral Belgium, Americans awoke to the full and terrible implications of a modern war. A taxicab army rushed from Paris, brought the miracle of the Marne. Britain's contemptibles, as the Kaiser called them, were desperately holding the Flanders front. American military men knew that Germany had devoted all her energies for 20 years to building up the greatest war machine the world had ever seen. Armies that were now systematically destroying in their advance the towns, the cities, and the homes of a simple, peace-loving people. And there were signs in the American community that the nation was aroused. Razor all right, Congressman? Mm -hmm. John? I'm not going to find it so easy to be neutral in thought. <laughs> Already the war in Europe was finding its way into the everyday lives of Americans. Americans of every age. H2O. Twice, if you please, Anna. Say, I'm sorry to hear that you're quitting school. Do you have to? What else can I do? I've got to help Mother. I don't understand Pop doing what he did. Well, I suppose you can't blame anybody for being patriotic. But he didn't have to go over there. It wasn't his war. The war will be over in a couple of months anyway. That's what my father says, and he used to be in the German army. I suppose he thinks the Germans are going to win. They win every day, don't they? Your old man likes Germany so much, he'd better go back there. That goes for you, too. Never mind him, Freddy. Hey, Freddy. Don't let that guy get you, ghost. The army advanced along the whole front again today. Some places nearly five kilometers. You're not eating much tonight, Fred. What's the matter? Nothing, Mom. I'm just not hungry. Anna Kovacs has had to quit school. Her father's been called by the Austrian army, and now she has to work. So? Dad, it's getting so that all you and everybody else talk about is this war all the time. Today, I said that you'd been in the German army and that you thought the Germans would win in two months. I didn't mean anything. It almost started a free-for-all, Father. That's too bad, Frederick. 
Perhaps I should be more careful. It is very wrong for any of us to get personally agitated about the war so far away. We are in America. President Wilson says, this is a war with which we have nothing to do. That is how we all must try to feel. Under the personal command of Kaiser Wilhelm II, the armies of Imperial Germany seemed invincible in the summer of 1914. And Americans began to realize that belief in a just cause was not enough against superior manpower and superior armaments. The bravery of the Belgians, fighting on to hold the channel ports, further heightened America's desire to help these stricken people. Most Americans feel that the invasion of Belgium was the most barbarous act ever committed by a civilized nation. We are not here to discuss the rights and wrongs of the European war. We are here to help its innocent victims, little children, helpless and starving. The Committee for the Relief of Belgium, under the able chairmanship of Herbert Hoover, can feed a Belgian child for a month on a $5 bill. It is up to us to see that he gets those $5 bills. Yes, and tens, and twenties, and fifties. A generous people had assumed its first responsibility of the war with the help of a young mining engineer named Herbert Hoover. Within three months, he had organized a fleet of 35 vessels carrying more than a million dollars worth of food a week to Belgium. As the war entered its first winter, American contributions were keeping alive 10 million homeless, starving people. Helpless wards of the one nation of the world still able to feed and care for them. Aren't these Professor Carter's? Why, of course they are. Do you suppose he's really bought a new suit? We can't send these old things to the Belgians with St. Luke's name on them. And those poor Belgian women. I can't bear to think of them. Well, I just can't understand it. Why, Dora, we all know German people. Some of us have German friends. Look at the Bensingers. They're as nice as anybody could be. Turn with Europe's war. America was a neutral nation of neutral nations on the high seas were being openly and flagrantly violated by Germany. What a way for a civilized nation to fight a war. Why shouldn't they sink English ships? So why don't the submarines give warning? So the crews will have a chance to get into lifeboats. The Germans have got to sink ships if they're carrying munitions for the Allies. And suppose they have Americans on them. They shouldn't be there. The German government has warned them what would be there. Huh. Don't make me... But far more fateful in loss of cargoes or questions of international law was the submarine steadily mounting toll of human lives. Men like Theodore Roosevelt were now demanding forceful action to uphold the nation's traditional freedom of the seas. But few Americans would believe that their rights were seriously threatened. Flash! And they've sunk the Lusitania. What? No circulation, we have an extra coming on. How many Americans aboard? 228. 96 point banner. Play up the American angle. Did 
The Germans had run a warning to Lusitania passengers. What do you mean? In an ad in the New York Times. In the Times? Have you got a copy? I didn't think they'd dare to sink her. The warning of the German embassy had attracted little notice. It was unthinkable that Germany would sink the Lusitania. Her sailing had been set for a Saturday forenoon. On her passenger list were some of the proudest names of two continents. For the Lusitania was queen of the great Cunard fleet. It was to be a gay and festive voyage. Nearly 2,000 souls were aboard. 1,200 never reached shore. No single disaster in half a century had stirred American emotions more profoundly. If Wilson stands for this, he'll stand for anything. Stand for what? Stand for murder. Murder of 114 Americans. Been there. An American citizen has the right to travel anywhere he wants to. We ought to lick the Kaiser now and have it over with. You're going to have a hard time? They don't care how many Americans get killed. And what'll they say about the Lusitania? Well, in Montana, they think if a man goes out in the street when there's shooting going on, it's his own fault if he gets hit. indignation, deep and mounting, swept every community in the land. Throughout the nation on the following Sabbath, there were memorial services for the men, the women, and the children who were the Lusitania's martyred dead. Well, boys, what's on your minds? We came to find out what you're going to do about the Lusitania. Tell the truth, I hadn't thought of doing anything. John, you're our congressman. You know how we're feeling. Don't you think you ought to go and talk with President Wilson about this thing? Well, now, boys, you don't walk in on the president just that way. He's already said he'll hold Germany to strict accountability. John, we've been hearing about strict accountability for a long time. It seems to mean that when a German U-boat kills some more Americans, the president just sends another note. What do you want to do? You ought to go to Wilson and tell him he's got to act, and act quick. All right. I can go to Wilson. Are you boys willing to go to war? That's not the point, John, and you know it isn't. The point is you want to do something, but you don't want to do the only thing the Germans would understand. War. This country isn't ready to fight a war even if it wanted to. Just suppose I do go to the president. Suppose he says, all right, if you want a war, you'll get it. Do you want your boy to go to war, Ed? Do you, Frank? I know how you feel. I feel the same way, but it's war or nothing, and I still think it ought to be nothing. U.S. opinion was still deeply divided. To demands for action, Woodrow Wilson answered, there is such a thing as a nation being too proud to fight. 
It was a bitterly disputed phrase. But other U.S. citizens were going to war. Across the border, thousands of young Americans of military age were joining famed Canadian regiments, the Black Watch and the Princess Pats, to fight alongside Canadians in a cause they believed to be just. Bought and sent overseas by the contributions of U.S. communities, driven by Americans who paid their own expenses, nearly 100 ambulances by the end of 1915 were on the battlefields of France. Bearing the name of a French soldier who had helped America to win her independence, the Lafayette Escadrille was an elite corps of U.S. volunteers. In the American community, emotion for the Allied cause was running high. And in a town as important as this, with the main line railroad, the reservoir, the college and all, they'd be sure to have at least one spy. Honestly, Dora, do you really believe Elizabeth Bensinger's husband is a spy? Where there's smoke, there's fire. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello, Hello. Hello Mrs. April. Hello, Bobby. Hello, Elizabeth. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Elizabeth. Yes? May I speak to you and Hilda a moment, please? Why, certainly. Hilda? I felt I ought to tell you that since we are working on bandages uh, for the Allies, we all feel that perhaps you and Hilda could uh, make yourselves more useful somewhere else. I'm not quite sure that I understand what you mean, Dora. With feeling as it is about the Germans, I'm very sorry, but I'm sure you will avoid unpleasantness if you go. Come, Hilda. community by 1915, the lines were slowly being drawn between peace at any price and intervention in the war. When I hear these fools shouting about being too proud to fight, it makes my blood boil. Don't they know that the Allies are fighting to save our own civilization? I'm glad you feel that way, Dad. Because I want to join the Lafayette Escadrille. What? I want to join the Lafayette Escadrille and go to France. Well, Walter, that's a fine sentiment. But I'm afraid it isn't very practical. You're hardly old enough for a thing like that. Of course I am, Dad. I'll take you at 18. But, Walter, what about your college? Oh, Dad, how can I keep my mind on studies with a war going on that's going to affect the whole future of the world? You won't have much voice in the future of the world, Walter, if you go over there and don't come back. I'll have to take a chance on that. A lot of other people have. Why did you have to talk to me first, Walter? Well, it... Because my father's German. Walter, I love my father. I'd do anything in the world rather than hurt him. Or let anybody else hurt him. 
I know he wants the Germans to win the war. But I don't. What do you want, Hilda? I want you to go to France, if you want to go. I'd be proud of you, Walter. So long, boy. Take care of yourself. You've been great, Dad. I know how you feel about it. That's all right, son. Goodbye, Mom. I'll write you every week. All right. Don't you worry. Hilda. Six hundred thousand casualties at Berton. A million dead and wounded on the Somme. And on the minds of men, the relentless pressure of war, dragging on into a third summer. At Jutland in the summer of 1916, the British Navy drove the German fleet to cover in the greatest sea battle of all time. And for the first time, Americans realized how great was their dependence on the might of the Royal Navy. The whole thing boils down to this, John. If we had a big Army Navy, we wouldn't have to worry about getting into war. I'm afraid there's some of my fellow congressmen who wouldn't agree with you, Jack. Well, they're wrong. And if Congress won't do something about preparedness, we'll have to do it ourselves. Say, Dan, I want you to put something in your paper for me. What about? You know that Plattsburgh training camp idea Teddy Roosevelt and General Wood have started? I'm going to have one here. What for? There's a war going on in Europe. You know as well as I do that if France and England are licked, we're next. You've been a soldier too long, Jack. Nobody's coming over here to fight us. Maybe not. But suppose we have to go over there to fight them. You know that's not going to happen. By 1916, Woodrow Wilson, now a candidate for re-election, could no longer ignore the growing demand for national defense. And he marched at the head of a preparedness parade. Republican candidate was Supreme Court Justice Charles Evans Hughes, advocate of a strong and forthright U.S. foreign policy. That is the real issue, the only real issue in this campaign. The president has kept us out of war. He has sent notes to the warring nations of Europe. That's all he has done is send notes. Yes, the president has sent notes. But he has not sent one single American boy to his death on the battlefields. Wisconsin. Charles Evans Hughes has carried Wisconsin by a large plurality. <laughs> 11.15 p.m. The Associated Press reports 
that with five states still unreported, Hughes is leading Wilson by a narrow margin. <laughs> President of the United States, Charles Evans Hughes. Here's to Charlie Hughes, drink her down, drink her down. Here's to Charlie Hughes, drink her down, drink her down. Here's to Charlie Hughes, he's in Woodrow Wilson's shoes. Drink her down, drink her down, drink her down. With the campaign slogan, kept us out of war, Woodrow Wilson was re-elected. The war in Europe had long since become a merciless process of attrition. To break the stalemate, Britain had introduced the tank. Germany was using liquid fire. The war went on into another winter, bringing death to some 5,000 men each day. had already touched the American community in many ways by the summer of 1916. The uh, Lafayette Escadrille is all Americans, isn't it? Yes, sir. Now, what would happen to you if the United States should go into the war? Well, I understand we'll be commissioned into the U.S. Army Flying Corps. Hello, Hal. Well, hello, Mr. Meredith. It's good to see you. It's good to see him back again, all in one piece, isn't it? It <laughs> certainly is. is. Well, boy, I, I guess the last thing you ever thought when you graduated was that you'd be an aviator in the French Army. Say, how old do you have to be to go to France? Hello, Anna. How's the party? All right. What's the trouble, Anna? Mother got a cablegram this morning. My father was killed. Anna. Do you think Walter Avery will be able to get back to America on his leave? Well, I don't know. He's a sub-lieutenant now, and they may not be able to spare him. in the ranks. You men are attention. And while I'm on the subject, you might as well get through your heads right now. But you're not out here for a vacation. You're here to learn to do a job. A job of defending your country. Maybe it won't be very long before you have to do that job and do it right. Sergeant, dismiss your company. Girls. Dismiss! Hey, 
Hello, Dad. Hello, Ralph. Hello, Mom. Why, Ralph, you must be tired to death. Oh, no, I'm fine. This is fun. Does it give you plenty to eat? Sure, all I can hold. Don't worry, Mom. Oh, Ralph, I can't help it. I hate to see you in that uniform. I hate it all. Oh, Mom. Dad, you like it, don't you? You look fine, Ralph. Just fine. In Europe, on a dozen separate battlefronts by the winter of 1916, four million men had met death in ways new and dreadful. And Germany had introduced the most terrible of all the First World War's new weapons, poison gas, chlorine and phosgene to choke the lungs and throat, mustard to burn the eyes and skin. To Americans, the use of poison gas seemed more horrible and barbarous than any other single action of the German high command. And Americans were fast reaching a decision. has also received the Croix de Guerre for bravery and action. Can you imagine that guy, Hal Fisher, with his name all over the paper? Boy, I guess I was born just a little too late. Don't worry. We're going to get our chance yet. Did I tell you I'm getting into the Naval Reserve? Naval Reserve? You ought to be in the National Guard. I bet we go over the first week we're in the war. Anna, I think I'm going to sign up in the Marine Corps. Well, I want to do something in it. We're going to be in this war. Fred, what will your father say? I don't know, but I'm going to do it. By now, pacifist songs were finding little favor. What's it over, sir? How much is this? To shoot some mother, mother, Why can't you make up your mind whether you're Germans or Americans? Come on, let's get out of here. It's time to put the sword and gun away. There'd be no war today if mothers all would say, I didn't raise my boy to be a soul. and explosions of mysterious origin had plagued the nation's industrial regions for two years. And Americans were now beginning to realize that these disasters were not all accidents. Thank you. How do you do, sir? 
How do you do, Professor Bensinger? Am I disturbing you? Not at all. Is there something I can do for you? If you could give me a few minutes. Certainly. I'm Karl von Schleich of the German Embassy. Yes. Professor Benzinger, it is imperative we stop the shipment of American munitions to France and England. As a German who is a respected member of this community, your influence can help the fatherland. Herr von Schleich, my home is now in America. I have a wife and two children who are Americans. If only for their sake, I cannot take sides. The war in Europe is a terrible thing. Naturally, I wish I could do something to help the fatherland. But, must be clear to you, I cannot. You know, I must report your answer to Germany, Professor Bensinger. Many Americans were beginning to suspect that the German ambassador, Count Johann von Bernstorff, was directing planned sabotage on a nationwide scale. An explosion of munitions on Black Tom Island, New Jersey, had rocked an area of 70 miles. Another explosion at Kingsland, New Jersey, destroyed in a few minutes millions of dollars worth of shells and ammunition. Time and time again came evidence that spies and saboteurs, well organized and financed, were attempting the systematic destruction of U.S. munition plants. The violence of war had touched the nation's shores, and America's traditional sense of security was shaken to the core. By 1917, Americans were facing the inevitable. I think most Americans feel about the way I do, John. You know I've never believed the propaganda. I've never been frightened by spies. And I've hated war. But the time has come when we've got to fight for the decent, civilized things in life. It's just that I hate to think that I'll ever have to vote to put this country into war. More and more, the war in Europe coming into the homes of the American community. I'm the office for a while, will you, Eddie? I've got to deliver a message across town. Can't I deliver it for you? I think I'd better deliver this one myself. We'll run this one, George. Walter April seems to have brought the war in Europe very close. Perhaps this war is no concern of ours. Perhaps we should be in it. There are sincere thinking men and women on both sides, and we are under terrifying pressure on this question. From England and France and Germany come all kinds of reports. Most of them are half-truths. Some of them are lies. But Walter Averill didn't go to France for lies. He didn't go because of the lurid tales about the Hun and Bosch. 
I think Walter believed in his heart the same as I believe in mine, that there is a basic democratic principle and a primitive might makes right instinct. And today, these two are fighting to see which will survive. I think that's the fight for which young Walter Averill was willing to give up his life. Like an open challenge to the United States in the first weeks of 1970, came Germany's declaration that she was resuming unrestricted warfare against the vessels of all nations, belligerents and neutrals. Now the German government tells us that she will let us send just one ship a week across the Atlantic. We are told when it must leave, when it must arrive, and where. We are told to paint stripes on it, that it must fly a flag of red and white checks like a farmer's tablecloth. I think I can truthfully say that no man in this house has advocated caution more consistently, has more consistently championed the cause of neutrality and peace. Now it seems that the efforts of all of us may be in vain. If they are to be in vain, then I say this. Let us thank God that we are on the side of justice and the right. <laughs> came U.S. Ambassador James W. Girard. In his disarming rumors that Germans were attempting to promote an attack through Mexico against the United States. The nation was tense with expectation. And on the cold March day of Woodrow Wilson's second inaugural, the nation's men of state, as well as all the solemn thousands who crowded into Washington, felt that they were witnessing the close of one era in American history, the beginning of another. By March, the U.S. flag had been all but driven from the Atlantic by German submarines. For America, freedom of the seas had ceased to exist. As the first important act of his second term, Woodrow Wilson signed an executive order which armed all U.S. merchant ships with naval guns. It was another compromise, called by Woodrow Wilson, armed neutrality. Congressman Lawton, good evening. This is the Western Union. I have a telegram for you from Washington, signed Carter, Sergeant at Arms. The message reads, three more American ships having been torpedoed. The president has advanced the date of the special session of Congress to April 2nd. That's signed Carter, Sergeant at Arms. Armed neutrality had failed. The American people looked to the White House. For three years, Woodrow Wilson had compromised with Germany, and each new compromise had brought new indignity. Now his people wanted war. On the evening of April 2nd, 1917, the entire nation awaited Woodrow Wilson's fateful answer. The answer came. Calling upon the nation to mobilize its resources and its manpower, Woodrow Wilson declared that America had no quarrel with the German people, sought no dominion and no conquest. 
But the Imperial German government had subjected the rights and the ideals of the United States to such violation as no nation of free men could endure. It's a great speech so far. Here's the end of it now. For democracy. For the right of those who submit to authority to have a voice in their own governments for the rights and liberties of small nations for a universal dominion of right by such a concert of free peoples as shall bring peace and safety to all nations and make the world itself at last free to such a task, we can dedicate our lives and our fortunes with the pride of those who know that the day has come when America is privileged to spend her blood for the principles which gave her birth and happiness and the peace which she has treasured. God helping her, she can do no other. Okay, George. Three column box on the front page, run it over. Edit, the president's war message. With the main head, Wilson calls for war. February 10th, 1899. Place of birth. Mile City, Montana. I'm not going to make a speech here today. You're leaving home to begin the long trek to France. No words of mine can tell you what you're going to fight for. You all know. The only thing I can say is we're all proud of you. Goodbye and good luck. Right. Hey. Come on.
with serious purpose, the nation dug in for the biggest job it had ever tackled. Starting with a regular army of 130,000 and 70,000 half-trained, ill-equipped reserves, the United States undertook a mobilization of manpower and resources without precedent in any age or any time. To equip America's soldiers was U.S. industry's first job. Production began on 14 million uniforms, 27 million pairs of shoes, three and one half million rifles and bayonets, a quarter of a million machine guns, In the nation's war effort, every citizen was to take a part. Ed, how about putting me to work as one of your four-minute men? You young fellows have more than you can handle. And I'd like to help in this war, too. Well, Dr. Hatfield, it's pretty strenuous. Four or five speeches a day. Uh, that doesn't worry me a bit. I've been preaching sermons since you were a boy in knee pants. All right. When can you start? Start now. Through Liberty Loans, the American people raised the huge sum of $24 billion. Within three months after the declaration of war came the draft, the first military conscription since the war between the states. 24 million men of military age registered for war service and waited for their numbers to come up. In the 19 months of war, there were to be three drawings of the draft lottery. Is that you, stranger? Yup. Had a hunch my number was due up. Look, here's another one. By the spring of 1918, a nation that for half a century had not fought a major war had called nearly three million of its citizens to the colors. Another three million men were at work in U.S. war industries. The biggest job was steel, and more steel. Steel for the big shells, more steel for the big guns. With its experience in supplying French and British armies, American industry in the first year produced one million tons of munitions. Meanwhile in France, French and British manpower continued to hold off the powerful German war machine. For their new ally 3,000 miles away was unprepared and could not send the trained men so desperately needed to stop the great German drive of late 1917. It was not until early 1918 that America's first million were equipped and in training. Still ahead were weeks of body-hardening marches, long, precious weeks of training for trench warfare, for going over the top, for convoys and submarine patrols, crews for transports. Transferred to the Army were the Navy's regiments of U.S. Marines, soldier sailors who were to take their places on the battlefields of France. Private Benzinger, report the commanding officer immediately. Hogan, up front. Inspection. Oh. What? Oh. Private Benzinger, sir. Yes, uh, at ease. You know, I suppose, that your father has been interned as an enemy alien. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, but I have to tell you that it will not be possible for you to go overseas with the regiment under the circumstances. 
Yes, sir. That's all, I'm afraid. Aye, aye, sir. Getting everything you want? Well, almost. That's fine. Nothing too good for our boys. Can I have a package of sweet caps, please? Why, certainly, Eddie. Did you know my outfit was leaving tonight, Mrs. Avril? I suppose you're awfully glad. You bet. Well, hello there. Hello, dear. Evening, Ruth. I'll be with you in just a minute. Mr. Lawton? Yes, my boy. Could you do me a special favor? Doing favors is a congressman's main job. Well, do you suppose you could have me ordered over to France in a hurry? <laughs> I'm afraid if I don't get over there pretty soon, there won't be any war left to fight. <laughs> I wouldn't worry too much about that, my boy. Oh. Good night, Mrs. Avery. Goodbye, Eddie. Good luck. Thank you. Under the command of Admiral William Sims, since the declaration of war, U.S. destroyers had been helping to rid the seas of the German U-boat with the aid of a new British weapon, the depth bomb. For a year, U.S. dreadnoughts had been with the British fleet at Scapa Flow. Now the efforts of a united America were producing results. One million soldiers trained and equipped were ready to join their allies. In May 1918 began the greatest overseas movement of troops in all history. It was the citizen army of the world's greatest democracy to fight in a foreign land for American ideals. For those ideals, one man in every 20 was destined to give up his life. people of Europe, these fresh and determined men were like saviors. They had come none too soon. In the spring of 1918, Germany had launched her last and greatest offensive. The first contingent of Americans met their baptism of fire in the heaviest fighting of the war.
carrying on at home, men, women, and children were doing their bit, united toward a common goal. Look, Miss Hatch, 15 radishes. Have I gone over the top? In one single mammoth effort to help feed the Allied armies, to keep alive Europe's 30 million refugees, the American people resolved that no sacrifice could be too great, or food would win the war. To keep the endless convoys moving with their cargoes of food and materials of war, to replace the thousands of tons of shipping destroyed by German submarines, American shipbuilders were engaged in the greatest construction program of all time. By the summer of 1918, more than a ship a day was going down the ways. Ships of steel, wooden ships, even ships made of concrete. To France in 1918 went many a U.S. political figure, great and small. What is the type of your artillery support? Qu'est-ce que nous avions comme artillerie support? Nous étions supportés par les batteries de 75 et l'artillerie lourde. We had in support both uh, heavy artillery and 75s. Thank you. On French soil in the ranks of the AEF, two million strong, were many young Americans destined to be among their nation's future leaders. And to the front lines went Franklin Delano Roosevelt, then the young assistant secretary of the Navy. Courageous to the point of recklessness, American forces by the fall of 1918 had suffered nearly 300,000 casualties, 50,000 killed in action. Eddie, here's a friend of yours. It's John Lawton from back home, Eddie. Mr. Lawton? How did you ever find out where I was, Mr. Lawton? Oh, that wasn't so hard. Gee. I never expected to see anybody from back home, way over here. There were to be more casualties. But in the Argonne on September 29th, Americans had broken the Hindenburg Line, last stronghold of German forces on French soil. Throughout the first week of November, there were repeated rumors of German capitulation. A false report reached America that an armistice had been signed. But the war went on. Then on November 11, taking suddenness. No event in all recorded history had swept the minds and hearts of men throughout the world 
with so deep and wild a fervor of thanksgiving. had taken four long years and the combined efforts of most of the nations of the world to destroy the great German war machine which had threatened their civilization. The American community in the winter of 1918 was preparing to celebrate a new year. Americans faced their future with the confidence of a people who had accepted the gravest responsibility their age could offer. They had fought for and preserved the way of life, which was their American heritage. Well, in a few minutes now, it'll be 1919. Dan, how about a toast? You know, I have never forgotten, and I suppose I never will forget, the President's words when he told us why we were going to war. I would say, to the things we fought for and won, democracy, the right of those who submit to authority, to have a voice in their own governments, the rights and liberties of small nations, a peace that will bring safety to all peoples and make the world itself at last free. the Germany of 1940 and its war machine is a blueprint for world conquest, a book which every good Nazi knows by heart. Its title, Mein Kampf. Its author, Adolf Hitler. Democracy is a monstrosity, born of filth and fire. While democracy talks, we act. Borders are made by man and can be changed by man. Germany will be the world power or nothing. Almighty God, bless our battles. First step to conquest in the Nazi scheme is to demoralize the enemy by propaganda, to inspire fear and to breed terror. At Bermuda, British contraband control officers have intercepted tons of Nazi propaganda destined to make the Americas fear the might of Germany's great war machine. Most famous piece of confiscated Nazi propaganda is an English language version of the motion picture Feuertoffer, Baptism of Fire, showing the horror and detailing the technique of the Blitzkrieg. Hitler used this film to soften up resistance in the European nations he was about to destroy. The appointed hour is at hand. The attack is geared for lightning swiftness and irresistible power. 
Total war is a science that Germany has mastered. The operation is directed from the Fuhrer's private railway carriage. For the Fuhrer himself is the final source of all decisions and commands. The orders go out to the various divisions and commanders, assuring perfect coordination of the attack. The first units to contact the enemy are those of the German Air Force. The years of sacrifice to develop this great air force have not been in vain. For thousands of planes will carry the attack to every part of the enemy territory. Stuka planes, perfected by German engineers, dive thousands of feet upon their targets. The Stuka pilot dives upon a railroad junction. To bomb the target, he aims his machine directly down upon it. force in total war is to attack enemy airfields and disperse enemy concentrations of troops and materiel, to disrupt enemy communications far behind the lines, and to destroy the enemy's vital industrial centers. Against aircraft, such antiquated weapons as armored trains are utterly useless. Because mastery of the air is vital to the lightning attack, airports, both civilian and military, are among our first objectives. Within a few days, the inferior air force of the enemy has been completely destroyed, and the German air force rules supreme. To halt the advance of our forces, the enemy has blown up his bridges. But detachments of engineers, assisted by Reich labor service men, restore without delay any roads or bridges rendered impassable by the enemy. And our troops continue their advance unhindered. Lightning attack demands the acceleration of all movements. If bridges are scarce, German forces, even heavy mechanized units, have ways of crossing rivers without them. Meanwhile, parachute troops are dropped behind the lines. These men are able to capture strategic telephone, telegraph, and wireless stations and cause great panic and confusion, particularly among civilians. Ranging far ahead of the main body of the army, Panzer divisions, small mechanized, highly mobile units, have penetrated to enemy cities far behind the main battlefront. If the surprised enemy garrison cannot be overcome with hand grenades and light artillery, their hiding place is sprayed with gasoline.
the infantry follows the mechanized divisions to destroy the main armies of the enemy. Hardened by long training, the German soldier has incredible physical endurance. Sometimes he must advance 30 or 35 miles a day with no rest and little sleep for more than a week. The capital city of the enemy nation is reached within a few days. When the enemy does not adopt the reasonable course of unconditional surrender, his capital must, unfortunately, be destroyed. which make war upon Germany must be prepared to face the consequences of their acts. The enemy at last has no alternative but surrender. Because of his senseless resistance, the terms will now be less lenient. There is no possibility of compromise with the victorious German army. Quantities of war materials of all kinds have been captured. More than enough to replace what has been lost by the German forces. Within the city, German soldiers are greeted by loyal friends and admirers. In every country, Germany has such friends. Those who have been of service to Germany behind enemy lines are given an opportunity to identify persons who have persecuted them before the German conquest. Such persons will be shot. As a result of their mad desire to wage war upon Germany, Hundreds of thousands of the enemy's most able-bodied men have temporarily lost their freedom. They will be formed into labor battalions and sent to Germany to help with the harvests and otherwise to take the place of German fighters on other fronts. Under German supervision, many of these men will do useful work for the first time in their lives. The enemy is no more. Before the power of German arms and the terror of propaganda, Nine once free nations have already fallen under the domination of Adolf Hitler. And upon German conquest, Hitler has set no limits. The slogan of his war machine, Today we are masters of Europe. Tomorrow we shall rule the world. Wenn wir bereit sein werden, unsere überseeischen Pläne zu verwirklichen, können wir mit Bestimmtheit auf die Unterstützung unserer vielen Freunde in Amerika rechnen. Dieses Mal wird kein neuer Wilson in der Lage sein, Amerika gegen uns aufzuhetzen. Amerikaner sind keine Soldaten. Ihre militärische Unfähigkeit ist der beste Beweis für die Minderwertigkeit und Dekadenz der sogenannten Neuen Welt. Again today, as in the years of 1917 and 18, the American people are preparing to meet the challenge of might makes right. 
Overwhelmingly, we as a nation, we are convinced that military and naval victory for the gods of force and hate would endanger the institutions of democracy in the Western world. Once more, the future of the nation, the future of the American people, is at stake. I call for effort, courage, sacrifice, devotion, granting the love of freedom. All of these are possible. And the love of freedom is still fierce, still steady in the nation today. Our way of life is in competition with Hitler's way of life. And I promise to outdistance him in any contest he may choose. And I promise you that when we beat him, we will beat him on our own terms and in the American way. Today, under leaders united in their determination to meet force with superior force, Americans themselves once more stand united against the powers of aggression. And as Americans measure their nation's strength, they remember that there have been other times of crisis when the people of America have taken up arms. The founders of America fought for freedom and established their republic by force of arms. Other generations of Americans have fought to preserve it. And Americans today remember that their nation's courage has been tested under fire within the memory of men now living. For in their brave little world, Americans of a generation ago met crisis and emerged from it citizens of the greatest nation on earth. Now an old man would like to make a toast to the generations yet to come. In peace may they cherish the which we are handing on down to them. In crisis may they unite and know as we have known the joy and strength of uniting. In war, if it should ever come again, May they hold the ramparts of our democracy and freedom until kingdom come. <laughs>